All right, so we're going to commence the static posture assessment from the posterior view, and we're going to begin at the ankles or at the feet and work our way all the way up to the head. So the first thing we want to do is get behind the client, and we want to look at their Achilles. And what we're looking for here is how vertically aligned both of the Achilles tendons are. And if we look at Ben's here, the first thing we can see is both Achilles bow medially just slightly. We see that? Yep. So both Achilles bow inward. And what that means is that he has slightly collapsed arches, or he's a little bit overpronated. So on our postural appraisal form for the feet, we're going to tick pronated, and I would call that slight for Ben. But it is really important when you position yourself to look at this pronation that you stand back um, probably between one and two metres, uh, get down at the level of the Achilles so you can really uh, get a good gauge on that degree of pronation. Now what I also like to do while we're here is move myself slightly to the side and you can check out how fallen or collapsed this longitudinal arch is. Now this is the main arch of the inside aspect of the foot and if people are slightly bowed or pronated here then you'll see that that arch is going to be slightly collapsed. Now I'll confirm that from the anterior view, but sometimes it's just worth noting whilst you're here and that can give you a degree or an indication as to how severe that pronation and or collapsed arch is. So after we've looked at the feet, I move up and I just check out the level of asymmetry of the calf muscles or gastroc soleus complex. So I'm going to come behind here and I'm just going to see if there's any difference in bulk there uh, we typically see this with unilateral athletes where they use one side of the body more than the other. But looking at Ben's, I don't think we've got any huge asymmetry there. Then if we move up to the knees, the next aspect that we're going to look at is the smile or the creases behind the knee. Now I'm looking for if they're level here. So they should form, I mentioned smile before, they'll angle down. So it should form a smile if you look at both of those creases together. And we can see Ben's does exactly that. And then I'm just going to come back and have a look to see if one crease is higher than the other. So looking at this, I'm going to suggest that the crease on Ben's right leg is slightly higher than the left. Can you see that, eh? Yeah. So immediately my suspicion is that there may be a slight leg length discrepancy here. And I'm going to confirm or deny that when I get up to the hips. All right, so at the moment, I'm just assuming that that right leg might be a little bit shorter than the left, but you know, we need to go further along in our investigation to, to ascertain whether that's the case. Then we're going to move up to the pelvis. And the two bony parts that I want to palpate and feel are called the PSIS, and that is the posterior superior iliac spine. Now, if we look on most people, you'll see these dimples by the side of the lumbar spine, and that's what we're feeling for. So what I'm gonna do is kneel down, and I'm feeling for the two bony bits that stick out the back. So for Ben, and Ben, you can feel me on those bony bits there, can't you? That's the PSIS right there. And using my thumbs, I'm gonna have a look at that and see if they're level. Okay. Now, looking at that from my perspective, that does look pretty level. Um, so, remember I mentioned that we had this suspicion of a leg length discrepancy? If that was carrying on through to the pelvis, I would expect to see this. I would expect to see that right PSIS higher than the left. But he's automatically corrected. So, what I'm suspecting now is that this is possibly due to a different degree of collapsed arch down here, so it may not be a leg length discrepancy. And as a, as a PT, I can't diagnose that anyway. Uh, I'm just checking the levels, essentially. All right, so I'm just gonna look further up the spine now. <laughs> and I'm gonna get Ben's permission just to palpate up his spine, starting at lumbar, moving up to cervical. So Ben, is that all right? And I'm just feeling for the transverse processes, which are the bits that stick out the back. And as I'm palpating, I'm feeling for any sort of abnormality, and I'm looking for any sort of curvature to the side, which is known as scoliosis. So by palpating from the bottom to the top, I've detected 
and you can probably see this in Ben's thoracic spine, it curves slightly to the right. All right, so on my static posture appraisal form, I'm going to note that he has a slight scoliosis in his thoracic spine to the right. right. So I'm going to take that into account when I do my debrief and then my programming for Ben. The next thing I'm going to look at are his shoulder blades or scapula. Now I'm going to feel for the inferior angle bilaterally. Now what I can do here from this position is just see A, if they're if one's higher than the other. Okay, and looking at that, I'm going to guess, Ben, that you're right arm dominant. And he's confirmed that he is right arm dominant. And typically what you'll see is this right scapula which is the dominant arm in this case, will be depressed and a little bit protracted. Okay, so we've already identified that, that it's a little bit depressed. And then if we look at my thumbs, can you see that that right thumb is a little bit further away from the spine than the left? So that means that he's been pulled into protraction. That means his pec minor here is a little bit tight. All right? And this is classically what you'll see with people on the dominant arm in probably 90% of cases. So in my programming, I'm gonna note that I need to pull that right shoulder blade back into retraction and get a little bit of elevation so we've got symmetry. All right, so that's the scapula. Now the other thing we note when we look at the medial border is if there is any winging. Now, when we're talking about winging, this is where the medial border sticks out like this. And you will see this a bit in unilateral sports, so all your throwing athletes, and some of your track and field athletes like javelin, shot put, discus, where they predominantly use one arm, you may tend to see some winging. Uh, your, your desk jockeys, people that work in IT and admin that drive a desk for long periods of time, you'll also start to see this winging. And that's the result of a weakness in a muscle called serratus anterior. Now, serratus originates here on the inferior angle and wraps around. And its main job is to lock the scapula onto the thoracic rib cage. Okay, so it makes sense that if that's weak, that's going to allow that medial border to become more prominent. And that's going to affect how it moves when we're moving the arm. So what I would note there for Ben, I'm not concerned about any winging, although there is a slight raised uh, medial border here on the right but I would note that this right scapula is a little bit depressed and protracted, okay? Now moving up, the next thing that we'll note is the acromion process. So to find the acromion, you need to find the spine of the scapula, which in Ben is here, and I'm gonna follow that laterally until I find the bony prominence on the front of his shoulder. And I'm gonna look for those two bony prominences and see which one's higher and which one's lower. So standing back here, I think we can safely assume that the right acromion is a little bit lower than the left. And this aligns nicely with what we identified here with this shoulder blade being depressed a little bit. We can see that the acromion is a little bit depressed as well. And we can see that Ben has a little bit less tone in the upper trap here than he has over here. Okay, so we've got to work a little bit on upper trap and lower trap and serratus here and release that pec minor to get it back into a more neutral shoulder posture. 